Let's continue our lesson. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقالت اليهود and the Jews said يد الله مغلولة the hand of Allah is chained they said in mockery of the Muslims that the hand of Allah is chained the word مغلولة is from the root letters غين لام لام غلة غلة is to insert something into another and it is also to fetter, meaning to put a lock or a fetter or a shackle or something like that around. You can say the wrist of the person or the neck of the person. Basically, it is to chain, to bind, to tie up someone. Just like a prisoner is tied up, that the hands are tied up with the handcuffs. And sometimes there is a collar around the neck. Sometimes there is a collar that is on the hand which is connected to the collar on the neck. So, مَغْلُولَ is one that is shackled, one that is fettered, one that is tied up. And over here, they said this figuratively to imply that he is very close-fisted, that he is very niggardly, that he is very stingy, that if someone's hands are tied up, just imagine if somebody's hand is tied to his neck. Maglula. It's chained. Handcuffed. Can they take something out of their wallet? Can they? No. Can they give you something? No, they cannot. So this is a figurative expression for stinginess, for niggardliness. So they said, Yadullahi maglula. They said the hands of Allah are tied up. Meaning that Allah is very stingy. Now, why did they say such a statement? There are several reasons that are mentioned. First of all, we learned that the Yahud were very prosperous when it came to worldly status uh, up until the Prophet ﷺ came. They were very rich, very, very wealthy. But when they rejected the Prophet ﷺ, when they opposed the Muslims, then what happened? They started suffering in their Businesses in their money, in their wealth. And we know that they were exiled from Medina as well. They lost what they had in Khaybar. So they lost the wealth that they had. So when they became upset, what did they say? That Allah does not give us. His hand is tied up from spending on us, from giving us, from bestowing some rizq to us. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must give you. I mean, whatever He's given you, it's His grace, it's His favor. Who are you to say that you need more or you expect more? I mean, it's Allah's choice. If this is what He decreed for you, don't say that He's stingy. Like some children, if they want more money from their parents, they say, why are you being so stingy? Why won't you give me more? Because you don't deserve it. I don't wish to give you. You're going to abuse this money. So it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever He gives to His servant. So no servant can say that Allah is stingy in giving to me. This is extremely disrespectful. Secondly, it is said that they said, Yadullahi maghlula, when the ayah was revealed, that, Man zalladhi yuqridullaha qardan hasanan. That who is it that would lend to Allah a beautiful loan? So they said, Oh, Allah is so stingy that He won't spend Himself on his deen and instead he is asking us to spend na'udhu billah and thirdly it is also said that they said yadullahi maghrula because they taunted the poor Muslims because many Muslims when they migrated from Mecca to Medina they had left everything of theirs in Mecca and when they came to Medina basically you can imagine immigrants they need a lot of financial support so Yadullahi maghlula That he's so stingy He's so tight-fisted He's so close-fisted That he's not giving you anything Now notice over here It wasn't all of the Yahud who said that It was only some people But Allah says وَقَالَتِ yahud The Yahud say Why? Because no one stopped this particular person No one stopped the particular person Who said Yadullahi maghlula and because they didn't stop them, they participated in that crime. It was a silent approval. 
by not stopping the one who is doing something wrong you are cooperating with them you take a share in the sin so وَقَالَتَ الْيَهُودُ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ and notice how they say hand of Allah they only mention one hand they only mention one hand and in the response that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives he mentions two hands why do they say one hand in order to reduce the sifa of Allah that Allah has two hands and they mention only one hand why to show his stinginess to show his stinginess na'udhu billah so يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ Allah says غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ their hands are tied up their hands are fettered their hands are shackled غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ now over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us that it is their hands that are tied up meaning it is them who are stingy and remember that the punishment is always like the crime they said يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ Allah says no غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُعِنُوا And they were cursed بِمَا قَالُوا Because of what they said So the statement of theirs يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ What is it? It is قَوْلُ الْإِسْمِ It is sinful speech And in the previous ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said How come their scholars and rabbis They don't stop them? Which is why we see That all of the Yehud are mentioned وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودِ And not just some of them All of them said this Why? Because those who didn't say it, they didn't stop others. Bal, rather, yadahu, his two hands, they are mabusul qatan. They are stretched out. They are unfolded. They are spread out. Mabusul qatan is the dual of mabusul qah. And mabusul qah is from the root letters basin qah. Basata. What does basata mean? To extend. To spread out. And بَسِيطُ yadain, بَسِيطُ yadain, بَسِيط Same root بَاسِينْ طَى بَسِيطُ yadain is someone who is very generous Someone who is very generous So بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبُسُوطَةً Now, if you see, they mention one hand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two hands Why? To exaggerate or you can say to show the excessiveness Of his attribute of generosity that how generous he is that both of his hands are spread out and secondly to also imply abundance because the one who is affluent he can give freely with both of his hands isn't it a person who is very rich he can give with his right hand and his left hand you know when you have a lot to give then what are you doing you're giving with one hand and the other hand if you're just spreading things if you're throwing things everywhere then you're going to use both your hands. What does it show? That you have a lot. So first of all, it shows the excessiveness of his attribute of generosity. And secondly, it also shows how wealthy he is. The, uh, the abundance of the treasures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses. So, بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبَسُوطَةً يُنْفِقُ كَيْفَ يَشَاء He spends however he wills. Sometimes he gives a lot. Sometimes he gives less. And nobody can object. Why? Because everything belongs to who? It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يُنْفِقُ كَيْفَ يَشَاء He can spend however he wills. Just like you. You have your money and it's your choice however you spend it. Yes, you have to give zakat. You have to spend where you're obligated to spend. But then after that it's your choice. Whether you give it all in charity or whether you spend it on yourself or your family, it's your choice. It's your money. So when everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isn't it His choice as to however He wants to spend it? Who are you to say that He is stingy when He is not giving it to you? Or who are you to say if He is not giving it to the believers in order to test them? So who are you to say that He is stingy? يُنْفِقُ كَيْفَ يَشَاء He gives and He withholds according to His wisdom and knowledge. وَلَا يَزِيدَنَّ And surely it will definitely increase. For who? كَثِيرًا مِّنْهُمْ For many among them. For many among who? From the Yahud. What is going to increase them? مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ That which has been revealed to you from your Lord. Meaning the Qur'an, the ayat of the Qur'an, they're definitely going to increase many of these people in what? In تُغْيَانًا In rebellion. وَكُفْرًا And in denial. 
What is tughyan? Rebellion. Transgressing. Exceeding the limits. In the rights of Allah and in the rights of people. That in being unjust, in being unfair, a person exceeds the bounds. In being disrespectful, a person exceeds the bounds. In opposing, exceeds the bounds. So the very verses of the Qur'an, they are going to increase them in their transgression against people, against Allah. وَكُفْرًا And also in disbelief. Meaning these verses are only going to increase them in their denial of the Prophet wasallam. You see, if there is a person who is very stubborn, very stubborn, very spoiled, you tell them one thing, what are they going to do? They're going to say something negative. You tell them something else which is good, they're again going to say something negative. You tell them many things which are good, every time how are they going to respond? With something that is negative. Until eventually you're like, I should just stop. They're not going to listen. So the problem is not in the ayat of the Qur'an, the problem is in who? In these people. That every verse that comes down, what do they do? They find something in it through which they can mock at the deen. Through which they can find faults in the deen. Through which they are transgressing the bounds against Allah, against the people. And also they are exceeding in their disbelief. وَأَلْقَيْنَا And we put بَيْنَهُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَى Between them the enmity and the hatred. Remember these two words were also mentioned before in the context of who? The Nasara. Over here, this is specifically the Yahud. Before it was the Nasara. So it's not just the Nasara, but also the Yahud. Amongst whom there is Adawa and Baghdad. What is Adawa? What is Adawa? Opposite of Wilaya. When a person does not show friendship through words or through actions. And Baghdad is the opposite of Hub, of love. When a person does not have any love in his heart, but rather he has hatred in his heart. وَأَلْقَيْنَا بَيْنَهُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Until the Day of Judgment. As a result, each group from among them opposes the other. كُلَّمَا Every time أَوْقَدُوا نَارًا لِلْحَرْبِ They kindle a fire for war. أَوْقَدُوا From the root letters وَوْقَافْ دَالْ وقود. What does وقود mean? Few. And أَوْقَدَ يُقِدُ Is to kindle a fire, to light a fire, to set fire. So every time they light a fire for the purpose of war, they kindle fire for war. Meaning they wish to create some facade against the Prophet ﷺ. Do you understand? Every time they wish to kindle some fire some facade against the Prophet ﷺ, against the deen of Allah, what does Allah do? أَطْفَأَهَ Allah. Allah extinguishes it. They start something to oppose the deen, to create a huge facade. What does Allah do? He finishes it. He extinguishes that fire. How does Allah extinguish that fire? Through who? Through just the believers? Not just the believers. Even the non-believers. Even the non-believers. Sometimes we see that there are people who wish to say things against the Prophet ﷺ. But what happens? It's other Christians. It's other non-Muslims who oppose them. Because if we remain quiet, if we don't do something ourselves, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can use anybody to defend his deen. To support his deen. So, كُلَّمَا أَوْقَدُوا نَارًا لِلْحَرْبِ أَطْفَأَهَا اللَّهِ Every time they light a fire for war, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extinguishes it. وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادًا And they strive in the earth to create mischief, to create fasad. How? Through sins. وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُفْسِدِينَ And Allah does not love those people who spread fasad. What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, we learn that when a person says something incorrect about the other, then who does it fall upon? On himself. Like for example, if a person makes a dua against someone and they don't deserve it, then you know who it goes back to? The person who made the dua. The person who made the bad dua. The person who prayed against the other. Like for example, if a person prays to Allah that, Oh Allah, reduce the risk of so and so. 
Why? Because he's envious, he's jealous. He says, oh Allah, take their wealth away. Take this opportunity away from them. And Allah knows that they're not deserving of this bad dua. So what happens? The person who is making the dua, it falls on him. Where do we learn this lesson from? From this ayah. غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ that when they said something negative, unbefitting about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same came upon them. That was a consequence that they suffered. They said, Allah is stingy, Allah made them stingy. They said, Allah is niggardly, Allah made them niggardly. And especially when a person says something unbefitting to Allah, then he earns not just what he said, that falls on him, but rather he also earns the la'na of Allah. وَلُعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا Secondly, we also learn from this ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two hands. Because Allah says, بَلْ يَدَاهُ Rather, His two hands. Because a number has been specified. So it's not less, it is not more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two hands. And remember that His hands are above any resemblance to the hands of the creation. Because there is nothing that is like him. Thirdly, we also learn from this ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very generous. And he gives. Where do we learn that from? بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبُسُوطَةً If you look at just the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are so many names that give the sense of generosity. That he is al-mu'ti, he is raziq, he is razzaq, he is wahhab. Many names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would show that He is the provider, that He is so generous. And over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that His hands are outstretched. Meaning He is spending all the time, all the time He is spending, He is giving you. There is a hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him that spend, O son of Adam, and I will spend on you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said the right hand of Allah is full. The right hand of Allah is full. And spending the riches liberally during the day and the night. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right hand is full. He's always spending day and night. And spending day and night will not diminish the resources of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't you see what an enormous amount of resources he has spent since he created the heavens and the earth? Don't you see that? How much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to every single person from the day that the heavens and the earth were created? That He doesn't just give to the people, He gives to the animals. He is their provider as well. He is their raziq as well. And not just the animals, but so many other creatures on the surface of the earth, things that we know of, things we don't know of. So don't you see that? So what do we learn? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous and he is the one who gives. There is a hadith Qudsi in which we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, O oh my servants, even if the first among you and the last amongst you and the whole human race of yours and that of jinns also all stand in one plain ground and you ask me and I confer upon every person what he asks for. Imagine. Every single person is being given everything that they desire. Can you imagine? Every single person is being given every single thing that they desire. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It would not in any way cause any loss to me, even less than that which is caused to the ocean by dipping the needle in it. By dipping the needle in it. This is how rich Allah is and this is how generous Allah is. How dare you say that Allah is stingy? If you need something, then ask Him. Don't say negative things about Allah. Don't say negative things about Allah's creation. Don't say Allah never answers my prayers. No. Yunfiqu kayfa yasha. Another lesson that we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spends however He wills. It is up to Him. It is His decision. And His decision, His ruling is based on His wisdom. If He gives more to some, that is what He knows is best. And if He gives less to others, 
that is what he knows is best. You know, there is a hadith, the gist of the hadith is that Allah knows what is good for each slave. He knows that if he gives more to some, they will become rebellious. And he knows that if he will give less to some, then what's going to happen? They are going to become rebellious. So Allah knows as to who deserves how much. Yunfiqu kayfa yasha. We are no one to object that, oh, Allah should also give to so and so. How come the Muslims are so poor? How come we are so poor? How come I'm so needy? Doesn't Allah have mercy on me? Yes, He does. But He knows what you deserve. He knows what is best for you. He knows that if He will give you more, probably you will become negligent in your deed. And if He will give less to someone, maybe He will become rebellious because of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Yunfiqu kayfa yasha. We also learn from this ayah that some people, when they learn the Qur'an, they don't benefit from the Qur'an at all. Does it mean that there is a problem in the Qur'an? No. There is a problem in these people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 82. And we send down of the Qur'an that which is a healing and mercy for the believers. But it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. It only increases who in loss? Those people who do zulm. So what does it show? That it's not the ayat of Allah in which there is a problem. The problem is in the receiver. Like for example, if you look at any worldly thing, for instance milk. Milk, full fat milk, is very healthy for some and it could be killer for some others. If you give it to a child who is under two, that is something they need. If you give them skim milk, it's not good for them. But on the other hand, if somebody is allergic to dairy, if you give them the same milk, which is very beneficial for the child, are they going to be able to tolerate it? No, it's going to upset their whole system. They're going to react physically. So, what does it show? The problem is not in the milk. Where is the problem? In the person. Similarly, a person is diabetic. High sugar foods, they're not good for him. But at the same time, those foods are enjoyed by other people. They love them. But if you give the same food to a person who is diabetic, it's going to be very harmful for them. High cholesterol foods, very good for children. They say, give high cholesterol foods to children. Why? Because it's good for their brain development and so on and so forth. But at the same time, someone above 50, someone above 60, it's a killer for them. So what's the problem? Is it the food? No, it's the person. Similarly, the problem is not the ayat, it's actually the person. That some people, for them the Qur'an is a shifa, it is a cure, it is a dawa. And for other people, the Qur'an becomes an ailment, a da, a disease, a sickness. It increases them in their tughyan, it increases them in their kufr. Why? Because of how they take the Qur'an. Because of the wrong that they have done. In Surah Tawbah, Ayah 124 and 125, we learn وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ أَيُّكُمْ زَادَتُهُ هَذِهِ إِيمَانًا فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَزَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَهُمْ يَسْتَبِشِرُونَ That whenever a surah is revealed, there are among the hypocrites who say, Which of you has this increased in faith? Meaning, did it really make a difference in your iman, this particular surah? Was it really needed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As for those people who believed, it has increased them in faith while they are rejoicing. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَتْهُمْ رِجْسًا إِلَىٰ رِجْسِهِمْ وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ But as for those in whose hearts is disease, see the problem. Those in whose hearts is a disease. Because there is a marad in their hearts, this is why it has only increased them in evil in addition to their evil. They have evil from before. This is why when Qur'an comes to them, it only increases them in their evil. So we see that there are some people who benefit from the Qur'an and some people who don't benefit from the Qur'an. Some people when they learn the Qur'an, they become more religious, more closer to Allah. Other people when they learn the same Qur'an, they become more rebellious, more distant from the deen of Allah. What's the problem? 
It's not the Quran. It's the person. It's his intention. Because sometimes you will see, some people will say, oh, I read the Quran. But that is exactly what turned me off from Islam. Because he's negative. He's only going to focus on those ayat which go against him, which go against other people. And he's going to look at them out of context. So obviously it's going to go against him. Then we also learn from this ayah about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is informing the believers about the weakness of the enemy. What? That he has cast adawa and baghda amongst the enemy. Because once you know the weakness of the enemy, then you can deal with the enemy better. So this is a mercy of Allah that He is informing us. So never think that they are united. They may appear to be united, but know that they are very weak from inside. We also learn from this ayah that disunity is a punishment. Where do we learn that from? وَأَلْقَيْنَا As a result of what? As a result of all these crimes of theirs that are mentioned in this ayah. So we learn that disunity is a punishment. It is a weakness. It is a curse. It's a punishment. Even for the Christians, the same thing was mentioned. أَلْقَيْنَا بَيْنَهُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ Why? Because of the crimes that they have committed. Same thing for the Yahud. So if the Muslims, if they have disunity, don't say that it is a mercy. Because there are some people who quote this weak hadith. That ikhtilaf in my ummah is a rahmah. It's a weak hadith. It's a weak narration. Disunity is not mercy. It's a punishment. Punishment for what? For the crimes that the people have committed themselves. And unity on the other hand is a blessing. As we have learned earlier that وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ أَنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ Remember the blessing of Allah upon you when you were enemies and Allah united your hearts. Disunity, hatred for one another is a punishment. It's a consequence of the sins that we have committed. And on the other hand, unity, love, affection for one another, this is a huge blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are living in a house and you see that people are disunited, you don't like the other, there is adawa and baghda for one another, then we have to reflect on our actions. That where are we falling short when it comes to the rights of Allah, when it comes to the rights of people? Maybe I'm doing something wrong because of which we are living under the same roof, still we're not united. Still our hearts are broken up. Walau anna ahl al kitabi amanu. And if only the people of the scripture had believed, what taqaw, and they had feared Allah. Believed in what? Believed in who? Believed in all that is mandatory to believe in. Which includes believing in Allah, believing in all of the messengers, believing in all of the scriptures, and other pillars of Iman as well. So had the people of the book, if they had believed, meaning if they had the correct Iman in their hearts, if they believed in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam whom they recognized as well as they recognized their own sons, if they had believed in him. What taqaw? And they also feared. Feared who? Feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember when iman and taqwa are mentioned together, then iman refers to the state of the heart. It is related to the qalb, the sir, the secret, the hidden. And taqwa refers to what is on the apparent. It is related to the actions. So amanu, meaning they had the correct iman in their hearts. What taqaw, meaning they reformed their actions as well. Because taqwa is what? If you think of it, taqwa is to protect yourself from the punishment of Allah. How? By doing that which He has made obligatory and staying away from that which He has forbidden. So taqwa is about doing something. So they had the right iman and in their actions they did those actions which Allah had obligated and stayed away from all those things that Allah had forbidden. So if they had done this, لَكَفَّرْنَا عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ Then surely we would have obliterated, we would have pardoned them for their sins. وَلَأَدُخَلْنَاهُمْ And surely we would have admitted them into where? Into jannat and naim into gardens of blessings. The word naim is from the root letters noon, ayn, meem. And naim is comfort, 
happiness, delight. And remember that na'im is of two types. The first type of na'im is na'im of the badan, of the body. Tangible, physical comfort, physical bliss, physical delight and happiness. So basically, it is everything that a person experiences in his body that brings him pleasure. Whether it is some food that he is eating that brings pleasure to his tongue, or it is something that he is seeing which brings pleasure to his eyes, or it is a sound that he is hearing which brings pleasure to his ears, or it is the temperature of the place that he is in that makes him comfortable, or it is the clothes that he is wearing, the place that he is sitting in. So, basically, the first type of na'im is that which is of the badan, any type of pleasure that a person feels, experiences in his body. Any kind of pleasure that a person experiences in his body. So it is of different, different types. And the second type of na'im is that of the qalb, the intangible enjoyment, comfort and happiness. That a person is in such a state of comfort that no worries, no concerns, no fears bother him. He has no worry, he has no concern, he has no fear, no anxiety, no sense of loss, nothing, no negative feeling that bothers him. Rather, he is eternally in comfort. Which is why we see that in Surah Al-Insan, Ayah 11 and 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَوَقَاهُمُ اللَّهُ شَرَّ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ So Allah will protect them from the evil of that day. وَلَقَاهُمْ نَضْرَةً وَسُرُورًا And He will give them radiance and happiness. Radiance where? In the face. When do you have radiance in your face? When you have seen something beautiful. When you're very happy inside. And He will also give them happiness. وَجَزَاهُمْ بِمَا صَبَرُوا جَنَّةً وَحَرِيرًا And He will reward them for what they patiently endured with a garden in paradise and silk garments. Silk garments. Why? Because that is also part of na'im. Na'im includes physical as well as the pleasure of the heart, the comfort of the heart. So over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, had they believed, had they believed and had they done what they were supposed to do, then we would have forgiven them their sins. And we would have admitted them into Jannat and Na'im. 